thought, well, you know, I'm kind of, I like watching movies, and I remember some of the ones that I've had. And so uh, if you remember Smokey and the Bandit with Burt Reynolds and Sally Fields, you remember the theme song, uh, We've Got a Long Way to Go and a Short Time to Get There? So that's, that's the way I was feeling when I started this. But the first, we're going to answer five questions today. And uh, the first one is, what is a kingdom? Where is God's kingdom? How do we join God's kingdom? How do we access God's kingdom? And what's the future for God's kingdom? So the first one is a definition. I'm looking for a button here. There it is. The first one is, uh, of course, Merriam-Webster is where I got all the definitions. Kingdom, a politically organized community or major territorial unit, the church, having a mon monarchical form of government headed by a king, Jesus. The eternal kingship of God, I like that one. I, I'm, I'm not fond of the Christian definitions of words. words. Words either mean something or they don't. And if we change it for being Christian, it makes me wonder if they're fooling with it. The realm in which God's will is fulfilled made sense to me too. Of course, there's, there's the word uh, like a cattle kingdom, animal kingdom, which has nothing to do with ours. A Christian kingdom, maybe. And an area or sphere in which one holds a preeminent position. Well, if God created everything, I'm pretty sure he holds that preeminent position. So let's start out with where is God's kingdom. And uh, it's safe to say uh, where God's presence is and whatever God has created, God rules. Makes sense, it's his. Even though hell is the absence of God, I think God even rules there. It's controlled by him. But there's a, we'll start out with the, uh, there's a specific presence of God. Genesis 3.8 uh, talk, and it's all, it's, it's either King James or living, or King James, New King James. And they heard the voice of the Lord of God walking in the garden in the cool of day, and the Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the gardens. Well, God wasn't there by accident. This was something I think he did regularly. Adam and Eve hid, but God walked with them. So I'm pretty sure that at one point, God's kingdom en encompassed part of the earth. Exodus 3, 5, and 6 tells us, And he saw, and he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon the Lord. This is the incident with the burning bush. Now, he said who he was, he's God. The bush is burning, it's holy ground. And so again, we have an, an example of God's kingdom on the earth. Exodus 40, 34, and 35, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Again, this is the uh, tabernacle that traveled with the nation of Israel. God's presence filled it, and uh, he once again was on the earth. Matthew 6, 9 is, it's kind of, we're all going to remember it the minute I say it, because it's the ending of the Lord's Prayer. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I'm sorry, it's the beginning. So we're pretty sure that God reigns in heaven. We're pretty sure that his kingdom was on the earth. But there's also... Uh, the presence of God through proxy, or the Holy Ghost is what I call it. And we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 6.19. It says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Uh, Luke 17, 20 through 21 And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, at first I thought that this meant within us, but there's also a lot of notes that say Jesus was standing there. And so the kingdom of God, Jesus himself, was, with, was there. And then there's the omnipresence of God. And I, I kind of wondered if there were scriptures about this, and when I found them, it made a lot of sense. Isaiah 57, 15, For thus, thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy places with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So we have God inhabiting eternity, and again here inhabiting the, people, the contrite people. So I think that God's kingdom is, is everywhere, 
specifically on the earth and spe specifically on the earth at times and inside of Christians. And I think God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. John 4, 24 says that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And if you really get into this in the Hebrew and Greek, it's really great because pastor taught about truth and he is truth. And that has a lot to do. We have to worship him in spirit, which I think is the potential that Christians have to be in the spirit. But in truth is a different story. He is truth. We worship him because he's truth. So side note, that's a good scripture to tear apart if you get a minute. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. They expected Jesus to come in power and in a physical realm. And I get it. They're, they're, they've got the Romans that uh, have control of the government around them. They've conquered Israel. And they were expecting a Messiah told about in the scriptures to come and lead them to salvation, and they just assumed that Jesus was going to form an army, attack the Romans. I mean, that's the way we'd have done it. But see, that's, that's what this is all going to show at the end. We can't get into the physical world so much that we don't know about the, the spiritual world. And back then, I'm not sure that they even had spiritual world on their radar. Uh, Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. These are fruits of the Spirit. So if it's not meat and drink, which is the physical world, and it's peace and joy, which is the spiritual world, I think it leads us to believe that uh, God's Spirit, is, God's kingdom is, is spiritual. Uh, I think that God's kingdom will and has at times included the whole earth. Zechariah 14.9 says that, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and in that day shall there be one Lord and his name, and his name one. So uh, it, that's, I think it has been, I think it will be again. Uh, the struggle between the physical world and the spiritual world has always been a problem with Christians. I've got a quick videotape. It is, it's a battlefield, it's a medieval movie, it's uh, the kingdom of heaven. Orlando Bloom, Liam Neeson is in it. It's a five-minute clip, and uh, we'll watch it real quick, and uh, we'll get going. They will ask for terms. They must ask for terms. Convert to Islam. Repent later. You've told me a lot about religion, Your Eminence. city. Before I lose it, I will burn it to the ground. Your holy places, ours, every last thing in Jerusalem that drives men mad. I wonder if it would not be better if you did. You will destroy it? Every stone and every Christian knight you kill will take ten Saracens with him. You will destroy your army here and never raise another. I swear to God that to take this city will be the end of you. Your city is full of women and children. If my army will die, so will your city. Do you offer terms? I ask none. I will give every soul safe conduct to Christian lands. Every soul. The women, 
the children, the old, and all your knights and soldiers, and your queen. Your king, such as he is, I leave to you and what God will make of him. No one will be harmed, I swear to God. The Christians butchered every Muslim within the walls when they took this city. I am not those men. I am Salahuddin. Salahuddin. Then under these terms I surrender Jerusalem. Assalamu alaikum. And peace be with you. What is Jerusalem worth? Nothing. Everything. safely escorted to the sea if this is the kingdom of heaven let God do with it as he wills This kingdom was here, and here. That kingdom can never be surrendered. I like that movie. Paragraphs have a sentence which sums it up in one of the, the paragraph usually has a, a summary sentence. Here, the Christians or Israelis have just surrendered Jerusalem to Salahuddin and when he asked Salahuddin what it's worth when he said nothing he meant this building in stone it's just earth it's just objects and when he said everything what he meant was what everybody attributes to that city he went then to the queen's or the king's sister uh, the king had died, her husband had taken the throne, he led the army out, which was completely destroyed by Salahuddin. And at the end, he was telling her, your brother's kingdom, the kingdom of God, is here and here, and that can't be surrendered. And I think it sums it up where Christians have a problem of we can't get our, I used to think, we just can't get our heads out of the physical world, and we can't get our heads in the spiritual world, because our fight's not against flesh and blood. So I thought that summed it up. It's it's on uh, Hulu. It's about it's over two hours. Uh, it's a little gory, but uh, you know, it's it's amazing to me that you can look at a movie that was made in 2005, and I can't say that the people who wrote it were Christians, but there was a powerful moment in those five minutes in the movie that said so much. So okay, we we know. So now we're going to move on to how do we join God's kingdom, and. Uh, I think we're doing good on time. We start out in Matthew 3, 2, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John 3, 16, we all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Colossians 1, 12 through 13 
giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Acts 16, 30, 31. We're, uh, we're at the jail, Paul and Silas. We're in bonds in the basement of the jail. It was miserable. They praised. God inhabited the praise. <coughs> and his presence literally tore the jail apart. Doors were open. Chains fell. So Paul and Silas come out. The jailer who was tasked with watching them knew that if they escaped, it meant his life. So he pulls his sword. He's getting ready to take his life. And, of course, they run up and say, nope, we're all here, which was kind of odd. I mean, I'm, I've, I've, been, I've been in law enforcement a long time, and I can't imagine if Peoria County Jail doors all flew open, if they'd all stand inside and say, wonder what's going on. Okay. <laughs> so the only thing I can think of is the power of God and the witness of, of Paul and Silas made them curious. But they went up to the jailer, said, don't kill yourself, we're all here. And the jailers are, jailer said, and they brought them out. The jailer brought Paul and Silas out and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, you and your household. Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We're going to tear this apart here in a little while, and it's going to get real interesting. Romans 10, 9 through 10, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart, those are the two keys that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. That's another one we're going to remember. So uh, let's go to let's go to Merriam Webster again. The word confess. I like to bounce back and forth between the Hebrew and Greek and Merriam Webster. I'm not a wordsmith, God is. So if you want to understand his word, you've got to really take a look at it. Confess means to tell or make known something. To acknowledge sin to God or a priest. Again, I think that that's the definition that they made just for Christians. To declare faith in or adherence to or to give evidence of. Okay, that could be your testimony. That could be a prayer. Uh, then we move on to the word believe. Consider to be true or honest. To accept the word, um, to accept the world or evidence of. To hold as an opinion. Now, my problem with this scripture is, believe with your mouth. I get that. you got to talk. I'm sorry, confess with your mouth. Believe with your heart. Well, how in the world do you believe with your heart? So pastor's preaching last Sunday, and he asked me a question, and God was talking to me, so I just said the first thing that came to mind. God was talking to me about this scripture, and he said, take it to heart. Now that I understand. You know, if my dad told me, look, you do that again, I'm going to whip your butt, take it to heart. I knew exactly what that meant. There wasn't a whole lot of question. You heard my dad once, you felt him the second time. So we go, and oddly enough, I plug this into Merriam-Webster, and they've got a definition. The definition of take it to heart means to, deep, to be deeply affected or hurt by something. And I, I zeroed in on the deeply affected. When we take God's word in, renew our minds, get it into our heart, we have to accept it and be deeply affected by it. Okay, it's not a casual thing, it's a life-changing thing. Okay, it should be obvious by now that we are talking to, or we are talking about what we call being saved. Matthew 16, uh, we're going to go and talk about something that I saw for the first time, and I know that most everybody in here understands what being saved is, but now I'm going to take you a different place and we're going to look at the, what the disciples did. Jesus, in, in Matthew 16, uh, 16, 1 through 4, Jesus is, and you don't have to put this up, I don't think it's on there. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, to be honest with you, this would irritate me, because as a cop, I've talked to a lot of people who really don't want to know what you have to say, and they really don't care to pay attention. And I don't think the scribes and the Pharisees had Jesus' best interest at heart. So for all practical purposes, this could be a bit of an argument. So afterwards, when he decides that he's going to go someplace else, he wants to address the disciples about this previous conversation with the scribes and Pharisees. I think that Jesus, what Jesus said and did was recorded in such a way specifically for us. So we go to Matthew 16, 5 through 12. And uh, bear with me, it's long, we'll get through it. And his disciples were come to the other side, and they had forgotten to take bread. 
Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. That's me. I'm in the spirit world. Messed up, Lord, my fault. Or I'm in the physical world. Messed up, my fault. I'm not thinking. He's in the spirit world talking to me, and I'm over here daydreaming. Which Jesus, when perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because you have brought no bread? Do you not understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took, neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up. How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not concerning bread, that you should be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? This would be him turning to me and said, look, I just fed all those people with a kid's lunchbox. Did you forget that already? And of course I did. Then they understood they how he, ba how he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bread, but the doctrine of the scribes, Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, uh, earlier on the, the thing that kind of probably was on Jesus' mind, was on the Sermon on the Mount back in uh, Matthew 5, 19 through 20. He just said, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoso shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were teaching the law. They were teaching the physical side of it that, con that convicts us to let us know that we need the spiritual side. But they stopped there. And it was all about what you could do, earning your way to heaven and that type of thing. So Jesus has already talked on this subject. Then he tells them to beware of their doctrine. And they can't get their head out of the physical world to see what he's saying in the, in the spiritual world. So Jesus at this point knows that he doesn't have a lot of time left. He knows that the cross is, is, is coming. He's got his 12 best men. He's having a conversation with them. And they don't understand this. Now, I don't know, but if I knew that my time was short and I have my 12 best men with me, I'm going to pay real close attention to what... He's going to pay close attention to what he says. The 12 men don't get it yet. He's going to the cross. He's going to die. They haven't been told that yet, or they don't know for sure. But the conversation continues. After he rebukes them, the conversation continues in uh, Matthew 16, 13 through 18. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Anybody have any idea why he asked them that? To me, this is the most ridiculous. If my lieutenant turned to me and said, Who do you say I am, Jerry? I'd say, Are you kidding me? What do you mean? been working for you for so many years. I know who you are. Who are you trying to kid? So there's a purpose. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, and others Jeremiah and one of the prophets. He said unto them, but who do you say that I am? And I miss this so much. You know who he's talking to? No. Peter was one of the twelve, but I, I, and I got that. I was right with you. I thought, he's talking to Peter. It doesn't say that. He asked them. All 12 disciples, he asked. Peter was the guy who drew the sword and cut off the ear in the garden. Peter was the guy who everybody thought they knew the question. Peter was the one that stumbled forward and said, I know, I know, I know. And he told him. So he told him, thou art the Christ. But they all knew it. So you have your 12 best men. You're getting ready to leave. It's been a three-year ministry. And you want to impart to them something very important. So you turn to them and ask them who you are. And they tell you who you are. And he says... Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto them, specifically Peter, because he's the one that answered, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonas, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which in heaven. That is what we call rhema word. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Again, the physical. Peter's buried in the corner of the Vatican in Rome, and they have built their church on Peter the cornerstone. They missed it. That's the physical world. The fact that Jesus is the Christ is the cornerstone of the church. It's spiritual. So again, men were in the physical. God, Jesus is dealing in the spiritual. But think about this. What just happened? Did they not just confess with their mouths and believe with their hearts? 
who Jesus was. Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet, but if anybody could be saved in the Old Testament, this is as close as you get. And again, salvation is not an event. It's a, it's a conversion. It is a point where the rest of your life starts. We're going to tear apart some scriptures in Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I looked up the Hebrew and Greek, and I'd like to do what pastor does, but there's a lot of Hebrew and, or a lot of Greek here, so I'm going to, I put the parentheses in there. But seek specifically to worship before at the beginning the realm of the abode of God by a baffling wind, his justification, and all these aforementioned needs shall be added unto you. So if you, that, it's, it, it adds a little bit to it. So we're gonna, there's a couple more here. We're going to go to Matthew 5.10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness, sake, for, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Supremely well off and happy. I love that part of it. Are they which are given to suffer? I'm not sure that works for me. <laughs> I mean, I, it just... Now, when we finish this... Uh, by reason of, character of, an act specifically Christ-like, for theirs denoting possession is the realm of the abode where God lives. And that is theirs also talks about the baffling wind. Now, I think that if we try and be a Christian in the physical, we suffer. We're going to suffer no matter what. The Bible says that. But if we're walking in the physical, we're going to suffer, and I don't like it. If I'm walking in the spiritual, the suffering gets a whole lot easier. The Bible says that we obey his commandments, his commandments are not grievous. And that really confused me for a long time. If you obey his commandments and walk in the spirit, it's not that hard. It's not as hard. And we're, we're, and we're going somewhere with this. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This one really got me excited. Supremely well off and happy are the beggarly concerning the baffling wind, for theirs denotes possession is the realm of the abode of God. And I thought, beggar? So we got the definition of beggar up here. Again, we went to uh, Merriam-Webster. One that begs, especially a person who lives by asking for gifts. Sound like prayer? Pauper, this system only created beggars completely dependent on outside help. So what we have here is a Christian who's not living in his own power, but by the, the spirit who lives in him, which is the gift from God. We know ourselves, we don't do it in our power, we do it in God's. And when we get to that point and we understand that, we start getting more success. Then I wanted to look up baffling, because we talked about a baffling win. And the definition of baffling is extremely confusing or difficult to understand. A baffling decision found the directions utterly baffling. Common to all three of the previous scriptures is this breath or breeze or Holy Spirit. And it's akin to the base word denoting baffling wind. And baffling wind talks about breath of God, breeze, and Holy Spirit. So if you look at the scripture again, we are blessed, happy, full of joy, because we are totally, totally dependent on the baffling wind, which is the Holy Ghost. And ours is the kingdom of God. So let's go to, and, and so now let's go and make sure that we're right. We're going to go to Acts 2.2. 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing, mighty rushing wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Described as the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 14.14 14, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Sound like baffling? 1 Corinthians 14.2 <coughs> Excuse me. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. This is our baffling wind. And when I saw that, it didn't take me long to put two and two together. This is walking in the Holy Ghost. So, we've answered... How do we get into the kingdom? Now we're going to talk about how do we access this kingdom. All right, back to Matthew 16, 13, and 18, where the disciples just confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior and took it to heart what they had done. Right after that, Jesus just, Jesus just got, their, got his 12 best men to confess that Jesus is Lord and believe it in their heart, okay, the way we believe they're saved. What is the next thing you're going to tell these guys? You're in my kingdom. Matthew 16, 19 through 20 
is the next thing he told him. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was the Christ. Here's the keys to the kingdom, guys. You just joined it. Here, just like your, here's the keys of my house. Anything that's in it, you have access to. The one thing that caught me off guard here was I always thought, well, we're binding and loosing and, you know, or it's binding in heaven and loosing in earth and loosing, you know. And I'm thinking, so then I read this and I thought, you know, it only goes one way. It says if you bind and loose on earth, it's bound and loosed in heaven. For years I prayed, I'm binding the enemy and I'm loosening ministering spirits. Well, I'm not sure that binding the enemy in heaven really needs to be done. God's kind of got control of the heaven. And loosing ministering spirits in heaven, two-thirds of them are still loyal to God. They didn't fall with Lucifer. And they're pretty scary and tough. I don't think that I need to loose them up there. They pretty much have free reign at God's will. So I started thinking, what in the world are the keys? And I think last time I spoke, I talked about some, and I had some of them right. But... Uh, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus had just preached the Sermon on the Mount prior to this. And I came up with a list. Or actually, I didn't come up. I, when I was getting ready for this, I made a list. And it, it was while I was doing this study. There were so many things that I did that I didn't think had anything to do with this that came together. I, was, I kept telling Pastor, I'm going to make a list of God's opposites. The world does it this way. God does it this way. While I was looking through the Sermon on the Mount, which was one of the things that I was going to, I was going to use context. I'm going to start here, and I'm working my way through two complete chapters. We'd be here forever. So when I was doing that, I, on the Sermon on the Mount, I made a list. And uh, there should be the next one up there. Okay, this is the list. Verse 1 and 4 covers giving, 5 through 13, prayer, 14 through 15, Forgiving, 16 through 18, fasting. 19 through 21 covers treasures in heaven. 22 through 24, darkness, can't serve two masters. 23 through 34, worrying and physical things. All these things that affect the spirit world that I called the opposites of God, I just found in the Sermon on the Mount, just prior to Jesus getting his guys into the kingdom, my 12 best guys, and now giving them the keys to the kingdom. And I believe this is what he's talking about. The next, this one is in, this one's in two. And, and, okay, this is the list that I had made. Uh, save and keep your money. Give tithes and offerings. Your finances are bound under a curse. You loose or open the windows of heaven in the spirit world. God should give you what you want or praying God's will, not our will. A lover of self binds up his prayer life. God's will is loosed in your life when you pray God's will. Fight and hate your enemies. Forgive and for, pray for your enemies are complete opposites. One, love is bound up in the flesh rules. The other one, love is loosed in your life. Hold a grudge if you are wronged. Forgive others to be forgiven. One is forgiveness is bound up not only to you but to the other person and forgiveness is loosed the other way which means that, forgi that forgiveness is loosed to you. The Bible says don't come, don't come to my altar with a gift. If you've got trouble with your brother, go get it set straight. Live for today, get as much as you can. God says do all things as unto the Lord. Worldly rewards are loosed. The other one is store up your treasures in heaven. They are eternal. I'm not sure which is more important to you, but it shouldn't take a long conversation to figure out. Everything is going to be left on this planet. There's only some things that are spiritual that are going with us. Work and fight for physical things. Seek the kingdom of God first. You can bind up your spiritual life, or you can bind, uh, the other way binds up worry and looses God's blessing. How many of you... Love God's presence or need it in your life. Every, you know, that's, that's just something on everybody's, that's the top of their list. Well, if we praise God, does that loose his presence from heaven to come down specifically with us? I think there's more than, than just this list. I think that Daniel got on his knees, reminded God that, hey, we've been, we've been here for 70 years. Your word says that you're going to deliver us after 70 word, years. I'm just delivering this to you, Lord, and letting you know that you made this promise. From the moment that he said the first word, Michael was loosed with the army. 
It took 21 days to get to him, but they didn't give up. Uh, the King James Bible says, For we wrestle not, I'm sorry, Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Again, we've got to get out of the physical world, and we've got to get into the spiritual world. Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God's in his kingdom. Keys to the kingdom allow us into that throne room. The blood of Jesus gets us in there on his righteousness, not ours, and we can have whatever we ask. I don't think that walking in the spirit is just hearing the voice of God and praying in the Holy Ghost. And I was going to say that we need to operate more in the Spirit, and I've said that before, but here's, here's what I'm beginning to think. I think we're already doing it and just don't even know it. I think we're making it way too hard. I, I think we're, 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 we're trying to hear God's Word all the time, and his, the, the, our entire day is a conversation with Him, and He's telling us specifically everything to do. And I think we pass up the fact that it's in our nature to be like God. When we study his word, when we turn our heart over to him, it's in our nature. And I think when we give, and when we pray for others and lay hands on people, I think this whole list of things are things that we're walking in the spirit and we really don't even realize. So I think we know now how to operate or how to access the kingdom. All the help's there that we need. We just have to know what to do to bind or loose what we need from that kingdom in our lives. And like I said, I think we already do it. You know, when, when somebody, all, all the testimonies that were given and people that asked for prayer, I think we're already doing it. We get together and we pray for others. We praise to get God's presence, you know, a stronger presence. You know, we come together. I'm a firm believer you need to attend church. And I tell people all the time that are the Lone Rangers out there, I'm a Christian and I don't attend any church. Well, let me tell you, there's a community anointing and power in a church where you can come and say, hey, I need prayer. And there's also a place where you can go and be ready to serve others. So now we're going to go on to what is the future of God's kingdom. And uh, Isaiah 57, 15, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy places, which him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. He, it is eternal. Matthew 24, 16, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then it will come to an end. Psalm 145, 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Revelations 11, 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Revelations 21.3, And I heard a great voice out of the heavens saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Mark 10.11 is my last scripture. Blessed be the kingdom of our Father that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The list goes on and on. There's probably 20 more scriptures that I had. I thought, well, if I run late or run too quick, I can quote 20 more scriptures. But by now, I think you get it. And it was really weird because I made this opposites list and then I'm getting ready for this and I run through the Sermon on the Mount and I get that other list and I'm thinking, boy, God's smarter than I thought he was. I mean, I made this list on my own and he already had it. I didn't have to work for it. So we go back to our five questions. Our five questions. What is the kingdom? We now know. Where is God's kingdom? We now know. How do we join God's kingdom? We know that. And how do we access his kingdom? We know that. And what is the future of God's kingdom? It is eternal. And the one thing that I hope that you take away from this is it's not that hard. We're making it too hard. We're setting too high a standards. We're, we're getting in the flesh and saying that I have to appear so spiritual. And I think it's natural in God's nature. And when we get that in us, that's where we're at.